Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Secrets in the Sand by Canterville Games. It plays an hour to two hours. It requires two to six players and is for ages eight and up. And in the game Secrets in the Sand, you are playing as an archeologist and the Minister of Antiquities has found ancient tombs in the desert and has asked you and other archaeological parties to go out and find them. Along the way you're going to find dig sites and other unique antiquities along the way which you're going to gather and bring back to the minister and score points. When you have reached the tomb or tombs in the game uh, you're going to tally up all of the points from all the different archaeologists and whoever has the most is the winner. It's a fast-paced game that involves utilizing quick thinking skills and placement in order to get to tomb locations before anybody else else. That's how it plays. Let's talk about how to set it up, how to play the game fully, and of course my review. To set up the game Secrets in the Sand, the first thing you'll do is unfold the main game board and place it within reach of all players. Then you're going to shuffle all three decks. You have the Minister of Antiquity cards, you have the Dig cards, and you have the Travel cards. Give each player a unique colored camp set. So you're going to have black, purple, red, yellow, white, and blue. Then go ahead and give every player five travel cards. These are going to be used to get along the locations on the board here. Finally, each player is going to roll both die sets, get a letter and a number, and place their camp on the corresponding point on the grid. And lastly, the Minister of Antiquities, uh, the person who rolls the highest on the number die, is going to be the one who's going to roll for the temple location. This is going to be the end marker of the game. After that has been done, the start of the game will begin with the minister drawing one of these cards and reading it out loud. It's a pretty straightforward, pretty simple setup. All right, so how does the game play? Well, like I said before, you're going to be rolling a die and whoever has the highest roll is going to be the Minister of Antiquities for this round. They are going to draw a card from this deck here and they are going to read it out loud. And every single one of them, or most of them, are going to say one dig permit for this specific route. And it's going to show you a route on the card. This one here says four, two, two. In which case, every player in the game is going to look at their board, or the board, and of course where you start with on your dig site. And you are going to formulate the numbers from going uh, in one direction to another to another. So for instance, if I was to be, I don't know, black here, I would have to go four in one direction, and then two in any other direction, and then two in any other direction. So I can go one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two. And then I'm gonna call out Carpe Diem, if I'm the fastest person. And I'm gonna go ahead and place. So one, two, two, uh, place it there. Now, now the rules state whoever places first is going to be the winner. However, you have to make sure that you have the travel cards required in order for you to place on that area. And if you don't, if you didn't actually have the travel cards required, you're gonna to have to discard one and this will not count. There are certain spaces on the board as you try and plot your, plot your route. Some are going to have empty lined spaces and you're going to need things like an airship to travel over them. Normally, in general, when you're choosing a route, you're going to have to have a line connected from one dot to another. If no line exists, you will need something. If you have to travel through forests, you will need something. If you have to go over a rock or through a river, you'll need something. And that's where these travel cards come in. So for instance, if I were to go across this one here and there's an empty space, I would need an airship. And then again, another empty space, I would need another airship. If I don't have those, however, not going to count and I'm going to lose travel cards for attempting to go through. Uh, the forest areas are going to require things like um, machetes, I believe. Yes, and then uh, the rocky areas are going to need things like dynamite. You're going to need to go through the rivers utilizing rafts. And then you're also going to have a rope that can be used to scale up and down cliffs. And that's basically what you're going to use using travel cards for. And these locations are pretty distinct and expressed on the board here. So plot your route based on the card and then call it Carpe Diem in place and then play out your travel cards needed in order for you to get your camp set up. When you place your camp and everything worked perfectly, you are then going to draw a dig card. Dig cards are going to have a value, usually, on hit on the top and then some flavor text on the bottom. But sometimes they're going to be worth either no points or they're going to have something happen. Maybe it's you get to draw another one or maybe it is you get travel cards. Dig cards are usually the way in which you're going to score points and you only get them when you place out camps from the Minister of Antiquities cards. Once that happens, once the minister reads that out and the dig card has been drawn, then the next player in clockwise order is going to start. They're going to draw a Minister of Antiquities card. They're going to read five, two. Players are going to chart out their path, going five in one way, two in another way, and then they're going to call out Carpe Diem, placing another one of their camps. And it's always the first person to do so. So if you are the second player, uh, it's not gonna count. 
if there's a tie, generally speaking, there's going to be a roll-off, and whoever wins that roll-off will place down their camp to find the coveted tomb location, which was placed on the start of the game. If you can reach that location, you're going to score 2,000 points and the game will be over. However, if you want to play a longer game, when the first tomb location has been found, you'll take both of these dice here, you'll roll them again, 016, you'll find the location on the map, and then you'll place the, the token. And uh, you'll continue from there up until the last one that you want to play with. So you can make the game longer or shorter, depending on if you want to do that or not. Additionally, if no one finds a spot on the grid, then the Minister of Antiquities is going to get a free travel card. So it, there's ways in which the Minister is still going to work. But in general, the Minister, unless you're playing a two-player game, is just going to be reading these out, and they're going to try and make it as fair and balanced for everybody to make sure that they have an opportunity to get to the locations they need to get to. And that's pretty much the idea of the game. You're just simply going to have them draw the card, they're going to call out the numbers, players are going to look on the grid, Choose a spot called Carpe Diem. If it is accurate, you'll discard your travel cards, draw a dig card, place your camp, and then the next player is going to get a chance to go until somebody reaches this tomb. And then you'll score up all your points. You'll count up all of your dig cards. Oh, I've got one worth nothing and one worth 50. Oh, and I got the temple, which is going to be 2,000 points. And if you have the most points, you're the winner. Pretty, pretty straightforward game. Okay, so let's talk about Secrets in the Sand. And we'll start with the quality. Uh, this is a high quality game. It's got a nice board. It's easy to read. It's easy to see where spaces require um, a specific travel card and where they don't. P passing through rocks or passing through rivers or forest areas, you're gonna know when you go through. Um, as well as certain spaces that are blocked off will need airships. And every single travel card will have an instance of what is going to be, uh, it's going to be used for. Oh, I've got a machete that's gonna go through the forest area. Oh, I've got dynamite that's gonna blow up rocks for me. And you'll be utilizing these in a quick, fa fast paced motion because the game plays simultaneously with everybody who isn't the Minister of Antiquities. And so you want to be the first person to find the route and you want to be the person who is getting closer and closer to the coveted tomb or temple but if you know somebody else is even closer and more likely to get that space, you might sacrifice uh, getting a dig card uh, and moving your, your camp base camp farther away. Um, but yeah, it, it all works out. It's all very, very simple as to how it works. Even these die are very nice. They, this is a, what, an A through T die. And then this is a 1 through 20 die here. And for the most part, finding locations, you're just going to be rolling these die here. There are certain cards that are going to have you rolling these dies as well. They kind of change the game up in certain ways. Um, there's uh, these cards here, the Minister, the Dig, and the Travel cards. All really nice, all really easy to see and understand what they do. And they have a variety of different numbers on the Minister cards, the dig cards, you can get anywhere from scorpions to uh, 850 points. So you can get some really fancy dig cards in here. And then the travel cards are all necessarily pretty straightforward as well. Artwork is solid in this game. Really, really cool. It feels like you're going through the Sahara Desert looking for temples and treasures and whatnot. And it works really, really well. The campsites are nice as well. So quality and artwork are solid in this game. I think what you see here is what you're going to get. And I think what you get is, is a solid experience. Uh, gameplay. When I pulled this game out and started going through the rules, I wasn't sure what to expect. I did not know that this was actually going to be kind of a dexterity time-based game where you're going to try and be looking at the board all the same time with everybody else trying to determine, okay, I need to go here. Okay, three, two, two. Okay, so she calling out three, two, two. Okay, one, two, three, two, and two. Okay, and do I have this? Okay, I have the machete. Do I have, uh, oh, do I have the airship? Okay, I, I do. A carpe diem, and I place out my piece. I drop down my cards. If I'm the first person, I score that dig card. It's very frantic. It's very fast-paced and it can be uh, frustrating. You can uh, feel like you have a specific location and it not be there, and so you're going to lose out on a travel card. Maybe you just missed one of the cards that you're supposed to have. Maybe you counted one extra. So you kind of have to be quite quick, but not too quick to where you're gonna mess up and pick the wrong location you need to go to. And in fact, the way I did it, a little bit of a house rule for me is I made it so that when you call out Carpe Diem, you place your piece, your finger on the space and whoever's the first person to place is gonna take one of those tents and drop it down, show us the numbers, show us the travel cards. And if you do, you get a dig card. If you don't, you just code a travel card. And, um, there's two different ways you can do it that I liked. Uh, one way was the minister, if, if the person goofs, the minister gets to draw a travel card and you just move to the next round. Um, but I think in the game's way of doing it, uh, which may or may not change because this has got prototype rules currently, um, uh, if you screw up, you'll discard a travel card and then the next player can have a chance to do it. 
And if there are no routes, then the minister draws a travel card. But I always like the idea of the first person can go for it, but if he's too fast, he's gonna sacrifice the expedition and just let the minister receive the reward. Um, this game has some random chance to it as well. So there are temple spawn locations and you're going to spawn somewhere on the board as well. If you're very lucky, you can spawn right next to the temple or the tomb. And if you can get to that tomb area, you're done, you win. Um, and of course, maybe if I'm just right next to the tomb and the card is a one, 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 and I started there, bam, that can be it. Uh, so there are certain ways in which you might just be, or even even just something better is, uh, or something more realistic is, you've got these tombs, uh, this tomb here, and you got all these other build, lo these, these like camp locations, and red is like drastically closer, which is gonna have their, a, a large, uh, likelihood or a more likelihood of them being able to succeed by getting that location. What I think would be cool is after the placement for the camps from each player, there should be little circles on the game board. There are like little red circles. And of those circles, you should assign a, um, a tomb based on the farthest location from everyone so that somebody might be closer to it, but at least it's the farthest location from everyone. So then nobody can end up super, super close to the tomb. And that's probably my only real nitpick with the game is spawning locations can vary. Some people are gonna have a better odds in order to get to locations, but because some players are probably gonna just be better at this game, be faster, be knowledge, more knowledgeable on what route they want to take, when they want to do it. Uh, you can think in your head, like kind of ahead, okay, if I get a 2-2-2, two, 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 I'm gonna do this. If I get a 5-2-1, I'm gonna do this, and plan it out. And it actually does work better than I thought it would, it would because there are a bunch of different minister cards, but I was able to kind of, okay, this can be up to five, this can be up to two or three, and this can be one or four. And so I can kind of gauge where the card's gonna be before it is even drawn, and I like that. In fact, even reading the minister cards out, I prefer people to just say the numbers. Four, one, seven, one, five, two. Not, not what they do, or they're like reading it and then they're like, okay, this is four, one, seven, two. Because then it gives people time to go, okay, one, seven. So I want everybody to have the exact same amount of time in their head to be able to calculate. Um, yeah, it's a fast paced game. It's something I wasn't expecting. Uh, this board here kind of made me think of a game like gerrymandering or like a tic-tac-toe sort of thing. But uh, like I was expecting like to be building little properties with area control. It does have that area control. It does have that randomness of where you're going to go and what travel cards you will need. Uh, there's another really cool thing about this game too, where if you don't want to participate in the round, you can simply just draw a travel card and you can sit out. Thusly, if you have a space that you're stuck in with no travel cards, you're going to need these guys in order to succeed or in order to get through them. If I was here and I needed to go through a rock space, getting this dynamite is going to be very, very beneficial. So this game is going to definitely frustrate some people though. Some people are just not going to be too quick to the draw and uh, it might be too complicated as to not how to play because the game is very easy to understand. But if you have really fast players and then some really slow ones, those players are going to be left kind of in the dust. So it's going to appeal to a certain type of demographic when it comes to these fast paced thinking, puzzly nature type people. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this game. I had a lot of fun with it, but we had some people at the table that top that didn't like it, and that's just based on the fact that they didn't enjoy the uh, fast-paced nature of the game. They didn't expect it to be kind of like this when they saw the board, but uh, I don't know. I, I personally thought it was great. I, I enjoyed myself. I think this game is going to uh, do pretty well, actually. I think if somebody sat down and played it with their friend group, uh, they would start to appreciate it even more and more, and I like to see even additional little things added to the game. I want to see spawn locations, maybe some unique different types of temples, or even a temple deck where you can draw from it or something like that. I don't know. There's a bunch of really cool things I can see being added to this game, a bunch of additional expansions or whatever. Personally for me though, Secrets in the Sand is a lot of fun. It's very enjoyable and it's something unique and different that I haven't seen played before on a board game. Thank you guys for watching with our Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Secrets in the Sand by Canterville Games. If you like this video, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe. Go ahead and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, for blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. And if you'd like, you can watch our live stream every Wednesday and Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST on Twitch. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to delving for the secrets in the sand with you next time.